Hi, welcome to The Church Split. My name is Will, and you guys know what we do here. We talk about topics that might split your church, and hopefully in a spirit of unity to keep everyone united on the fundamentals of the faith and let the molehills remain molehills. Today's topic is uh, one that is a personal pet peeve of mine, which is people's inability to tell the difference between the spirit and and their feelings. So we're going to talk about that. But before we get into it, don't forget to like and subscribe. Leave us a five-star review and a nice message as to why you think we're great. And also consider being a patron. Um, we have, because of the people giving to our ministry, we are now able to pay for the subscription to get all our videos on audio on all the audio platforms. So because of you guys, we're able to do that. So if you guys are able to give $1, $10, whatever, if all our YouTube subscribers alone gave $1, I'd turn this into a substantial part-time job, and that would be great because then it'd be a lot more content, more quality content, and actually a lot more deeper dives into theology, and that would be awesome. So anyway, just consider doing that, and if not, and you just don't know how, because you can't afford to maybe do that, then just watch our videos, share our audio, just get people to hear about the church split, because this uh, ministry has been very helpful for a lot of people recently. I've been blown away by the messages, so thank you guys for being along the ride for that. So anyway, uh, today we're going to talk about the wonderful topic of people confusing their feelings with the Spirit. Uh, I've heard countless times as a pastor and a Christian, and you've probably heard this too, or maybe you've even said it, well, the Spirit told me this, or I was just driving around and God told me blank, you know, and they, we just use these arbitrary, these weird phrases. Um, in fact, if you, there's a, a few examples, even in like modern Christendom where this has happened, recently we did like a response to that uh, Jubilee video, the middle ground of conservative versus progressive Christians, and the progressive Christian pastor, and I'm using those words loosely, said, what if God tells this girl she should have an abortion? And that instantly made me almost flip my table, storm the castle, and die like a fly. Like, I, that irritated me so bad. And then we have, you know, uh, there was a debate with James White and Gail Ripplinger. And if you guys don't know who either one of them are, uh, James White is one of the hosts with Apologia Studios. He's um, one of, probably one of the most famous Calvinists out there, but he's also a textual critic. And also, Gail Ripplinger wrote a book on why all modern translations are evil. And when Dr. White got to kind of confront her on some of her claims, she just kept saying, well, I just at night, God would speak to me with these things. And he's like, yeah, but these things are completely false. And she's like, well, God told me. He's like, that's not an argument. And here's the thing. The Spirit told me uh, just like in progressive Christians where they say, God told me this, or uh, if you're in the more conservative areas like extreme uh, Pentecostals or extremely conservative Baptists, you will hear people say maybe something like, well, God convicted me on this. And what these words are, these phrases, sometimes are a masking of just someone's feelings. They have a certain feeling, and they're masking it by saying, it's God. If I attribute it to him, for <laughs> just like you've never gone to a Christian school, if you've never used God as your get-out-of-jail-free card when dating somebody and wanting to break up, right? Like, you're dating this girl, you know, seems to be going well, but you're not feeling it, you're not really attracted to her, maybe she just annoys you, or whatever, you're just not jiving. And then what do you hit her with? Well, honey, I just, I, you're a great person. I just don't think you're God's will for my life. And it's like this ultimate card we just play on things, thinking that some way, somehow, we just dodge the bullet. And it's really hard to argue against it because people are like, well, I'm not arguing against that because it's just like this weird, um, ambiguous phrase that people use and they're hiding behind the name of God to do it. And that bothers me. It bothers me. And uh, so let's talk about that. So, uh, this whole idea of the Spirit told me, blah, 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 all that. I do not deny that God communicates with us, okay? But we have to be careful on discerning between spirit and feelings. Your feelings, bottom line, biblically speaking, are not dependable. This is why the Bible warns us about that. And, and, and progressive Christians, I've actually, Brenda from God is Gray, has said this on her channel that, you know, people can't, keep saying that the heart is deceitful and that they, it's not. And, you know, it, we just, it's a beautiful thing that God gave us as if she'd never read the Bible because that bugs me because, guys, your feelings are not dependable. Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his way, according to the fruit of his deeds. He's saying, hey, you know what? Your 
heart is sick, it's wicked, it's corrupted by this stuff called sin, and because of that, you can't trust it. I, the Lord, search your heart, and I will judge you and give to you according to the fruits of your own labor, essentially. And that is something that, I mean, oh my word, when I was in high school, um, I was so angry because many of you guys know uh, my, my history and where it's like, you know, I grew up in an extremely dysfunctional home and then I had a very, you know, frustrating uh, legalistic youth group and church in a lot of ways. And because of that, I, would gain, I became frustrated and I got so angry and my feelings told me that because they're wrong, I could be wrong. So I went out and did wrong things because you know what, who cares? They're so wrong, who are they to tell me to be wrong? Which of course is flawed logic, but a lot of people do that. Well, if you can do that, then I can do that because they feel like it's justified. And that's not how it works. And I made a mess of my personal life because of that. I got into bad friendships. I got into bad relationships. I got my first dating relationship really was so toxic. It's unbelievable that I even stayed in it. But I was just like, well, if they can do this, I can do that. And it's, it's flawed logic. You can't go by what you feel because it's funny. The more I followed my feelings, the more I fell apart. And the more things exploded in my face because your feelings are not dependable. Proverbs 28, 26 says, whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool, but who, he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Wisdom transcends our feelings and our hearts and our own minds. When we study, we gain wisdom. But where does that come from? It comes from a fear of the Lord. That proverb says, knowledge and wisdom comes from fear of the Lord. You have that on your belt and then everything flows from it. And Obadiah was trying to explain this to people as well uh, in verse three, the pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock in your lofty dwelling, he who say in, his, in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? You know, these people are thinking they're above everybody else. They're thinking that they can't be conquered. And essentially, he's saying that, that your pride is going to be your undoing. And that's how our feelings work. Proverbs 4.23 says, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. If you want to be successful in your life, you have to keep your heart. You have to protect it, for out of it are the issues of life. That's why uh, Jesus says it's not what goes into the man that defiles him, but what comes out of the man, because what comes out of you shows your in inward being. It shows who you are truly on the inside. So you have to keep your heart. You have to protect it because not everything out there, not every feeling that the world's going to say is justified is going to be okay. You have to keep it. You have to protect it. You have to check your heart, making sure that it's not being led astray. And that can be hard because it means discipline, right? We have to discipline our feelings. And feelings are not always something we can control. Sometimes you just get these feelings and you don't know how to control them properly. Uh, Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in its end is the way to death. And this goes into subjective morality. When people start saying, I can declare what's right and wrong for myself and God can't, and they get subjective, right? I can make my own right and wrong. You can make your own right and wrong. Everyone can make their own right and wrong. It says in the end, it leads to death because no one can agree on anything. No one has the same feelings. And you are just running around following your feelings and your heart's desire until you are broken, beaten, and battered because you did not follow the path of wisdom, which is the path of God. So you can't can't do that. So you don't trust your feelings, okay? Um, you, and we all fail at this. Uh, for the people who do not know, actually, uh, because of a lot of my upbringing, I, I started learning to like kind of, I guess, cut my feelings off. And that's not, I'm not trying to be all super depressed and woe is me. I actually hate victim mentality through and through. I can't stand victim mentality. But it's just, it is what happened. And so I'm not an extremely emotional person. My wife oftentimes calls me a robot. And that's, you know, something horrible happened. And I'm like, oh, okay. And it was weird because sometimes I process it later unexpectedly. Uh, when we had a miscarriage, I remember I was sad. But then it was like months later, we, then we went and saw the movie Unplanned. And that finally was like those, whatever happened a month or two ago when we lost the child hit me all at once. And it messed me up that night. Uh, recently, um, Fun fact for you, I live in Michigan and it snows a lot. I live in a tundra and we just had a tundra storm at like most of the United States. Hello, Texas. Um, 
And we were trying to back out. I backed out of my driveway, and because it's kind of padded up on the bottom of my driveway, my car got sucked into the bank, and I could not get it out. And I was so frustrated because gravity should be doing the rest. And somebody abandoned their car at the edge of my driveway. And so I couldn't even like turn properly to get enough momentum one direction without crashing into a car, which would be pretty much the only direction I could go. So I had to keep trying to dig my car out. I was chipping away at ice. I was digging and digging. I was out there for like an hour. And all I was trying to do was get some Korean barbecue. Very upsetting. And I got angry and angrier and angrier. And I was just getting so frustrated because I'm like, that stupid car is in the way. I can't get my stupid car out because this thing sucked me in. What the heck? What's going on? And I was just getting so angry. I cannot tell you how angry I was being. And that's pretty much what Callie will say. I, I'm like super chill and I've, I'm a robot. So I'm just like Mr. Even, unless something goes miserably wrong, in which case I just, I, I get very temperamental. I know my flaws. See, people think I'm self-righteous on here, but I'm not. Because I know what I am. I know my problems very well. But the thing is, is so what did I do? Well, I got angry and angry, and I got my car, rocked it back and forth trying to get it out, and I almost had it, and it started moving, and I was like, yes, 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 and then it gets sucked into the bank again, and I was ticked. So what do I do? I do the only logical thing you can do, which is I continue to dig out calmly. Just kidding. I did not. I get out. I open the door and I slam my door as hard as I can. And I was like, this is garbage. Why can't I get it out? So I start shoveling more. But what I didn't realize when I slammed my door is I broke something on the inside of my door. And now my driver's side door, I can't open from the outside. <laughs> oh, joke's on me. That'll teach me to have an adult sized tantrum, huh? So the thing is, the point is, is don't, don't, act on your feelings. And sometimes your feelings might even have the best of intentions, but your feelings can oftentimes lead to death or if nothing else, really an inconvenience at having to open it through your passenger side. I'm not bitter. It's fine. I did it to myself. Moving on. Anyway, so if our feelings are, are our own and they're not reliable, they're not dependable, they're not something we can do something with. So what does God say? Well, that's why God says, lay your heart and your anxieties at his feet. Let him take care of them because he knows that you are a subjective creature who has these feelings that aren't always good for him. And God says, no, lay your burdens at my feet. You cannot take care of your own feelings. That's what God's saying. And they must be sacrificed at the altar of God. You have to take your feelings there, and it's okay, and I want to make sure I say this because I want to make sure I'm not coming off like Mr. Robot here who's all anti-feelings. Personally, I can't stand them half the time uh, unless it's like my wife or my child, okay? Like, otherwise, I'm not a big fan of them because it's just – so um, – but – the thing is, there's nothing wrong with feelings. There's nothing wrong with having empathy. There's nothing wrong with feeling for people and wanting to be there for people. There's nothing wrong with some righteous anger. But what is wrong is when we don't check it in the bank of God first. We don't stop by God and go, hey, is this feeling okay? And instead, we just let them run rampant with zero checks or zero balances. So this is why God tells us to double check our feelings. First, he tells us to check it with wise counsel, right? With people. Proverbs eleven fourteen, 14, where there is no guidance, a people falls. But in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. So he's like, hey, look, you know, if, if you don't take any guidance whatsoever, you will fall. You will fail. Things are going to be terrible. But in the abundance of counselors, with many people to help you and advise you, there is safety. Why? Because you're able to bounce things off of people. You're able to kind of get out of your own perspective. You're, out, you're, you're able to kind of get out of your own echo chamber, maybe, even your own feelings or your own brain. If you're like me, I get stuck in my brain a lot. My brain will just keep going in circles and circles and circles, and it drives me me crazy. So I'll have to go talk to a friend. And you know, that's where Andrew and Brian come in. I'll just start bouncing things off of them, just trying to process what I got on my mind. So where there's no guidance, a people fall, but in abundance of counselors, there is safety. But then he also says in Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. In other words, a fool only cares about what he thinks and or people like him. You know, oh, well, I only talk to people who I know will agree with me. Uh, we see this all the time in various groups, right? Progressives, they keep their own little echo chamber, right? They keep all the people that agree with them, and then they cancel anybody who disagrees. We see this in some of these IFB circles or these extreme uh, conservative Pentecostal cir circles where if you do not, uh, you know, if you don't agree with them, you're not saved. Or, you know, the Pentecostal circles even, like if you don't speak out with 
the gift of tongues, you are not blessed by God, and therefore I don't need to speak with you or take you seriously. Well, that's just foolishness, according to the Bible. The way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but the way, but a wise man listens to advice. So that's the thing. We can't. We got to make sure we don't get stuck in that. By checking with God, we also know that we are doing the right thing because we know that he is the author of all things. So we're checking it with him. In fact, uh, that's why the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths, right? And in Proverbs 16, one through three says, the plans of the heart belong to man, okay? Those belong to us. But the answer of of the tongue is from the Lord. So if you want truth, it comes from him. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. Commit your works to the Lord, and your plans will be established. So if you want your life to kind of go right, all right, and this is not prosperity gospel. People get that confused sometimes. Like, well, what do you mean prosperity gospel? Don't you think God blesses those who obey him or those who seek him or those who whatever? Yes, of course. But you have to be seeking his way, not a return on the investment, okay? That's what a lot of people are doing in prosperity gospel. That's what this is about. This is you seeking God out of humble humility because he is the Lord, and then he will make your plans established because he's going to give you a new heart. Psalm 37, 4 through 5 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. But the desires of your heart, see, people get this confused. They're like, well, see, God gives me the desires of my heart. So right there, that, that, you know, I feel this in my heart. My heart of heart says this. That's not what it's saying here, that God just willy-nilly gives you the desires of your heart. Notice how it says also your heart is deceitful. What he's talking about here is the heart that he mentions in Proverbs 16, that all the ways of man are pure in his own eyes, but the, the Lord weighs the spirit. Commit your works to the Lord and he will, um, and your plans will be established. See, he's talking about being shaped into the image of God. The more you're shaped in the image of God, the more your heart becomes like him and desires what he wants and desires his desires. And then those desires of his become yours and he gives you those desires because they're of him. It's this little spiritual trickle-down effect, if you will. And then it says, commit your ways to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. So make sure you remember this, people. Make sure you are always checking in, in with God on your feelings. It drives me crazy. Right now, we have, it's like the millennial generation especially, but it, people in general are like dopamine addicts. Whatever feels good they will continue to do, and they will not discipline themselves. And it's hard because it's like dopamine is that chemical. Your body automatically launches off. So it's like you're almost fighting biology to a degree, but you have to sometimes shift your desires and discipline yourself against those so that way you can have a, bit, a better life in God. So you first must be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Then your heart will be closer to God's heart, not your flesh's heart. Um, so be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That's, that goes by putting your faith and trust in him first, and then allowing yourself to be sanctified, seeking him every day, and allowing yourself to be sanctified unto him and rejecting your flesh. And then the other thing is, is when people talk about this, I want you guys to think about the law of non-contradiction. It's one of the logical laws, all right? So the law of non-contradiction, Jesus says it basically in Mark 3, 22. Mark 3, 22 through 27 says, And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebub, and by the prince of demons he casts out the demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. And if a man is a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, for but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. This here, the logic of the house divided against itself applies to God as well. So here he's talking about the people uh, saying that Jesus is casting out demons because he's using the authority of a demon, which is contradictory. Like, and that's what Jesus says, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Same thing applies to God. If you feel one way, but God's word says another way, 
A house divided against itself cannot stand. Your feelings are not the Holy Spirit. That's what it's. That's what I'm saying here. You can, do not confuse your feelings with the Holy Spirit. The, your feelings will lead you astray, and you will try to justify your feelings all day long. We justify the craziest stuff as human beings, and we ought not to. This logic applies on God's end. We cannot attribute our sinful feelings, so that goes against his word, and attribute it to him. It does not work. A house divided against itself cannot stand. The word, the spirit, and God will all be in agreement. If the word says something, therefore God says something, and the spirit has revealed people something, and they will all be in agreement, which means if you're in disagreement, you're the wrong one, not God, okay? And this is the problem when people start trying to rewrite the Bible. Like, oh, well, we don't like that it says, you know, homosexuality here. Well, it's really saying arsenokoitai, uh, even though historically that's what never what this meant. But we're going to say it means pedophilia because we like that better than this. And they just, and we start chipping away at God's truth. So let me just say, stop worshiping at the altar of your feelings. Your feelings will lead you astray. They led me astray really badly as a young man. They led me astray miserably. And if you keep following your feelings, you're going to keep running into a train wreck after a train wreck after a train wreck. And you're going to soon enough be looking at your life going, I made a mess of it. And that's only because I've been making my feelings my authority and not God. You know, the best part about God's authority and making him the authority of your life is that he, his ways are objective. You always know it's right. It's always consistent. Your feelings are subjective. They change with the wind. I was in a perfectly good mood until my car got stuck and I couldn't get it out. And then suddenly I was angry. And once I got it unstuck, I was fine again. Feelings are fleeting. But God is not. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So essentially what we're, what we're doing here is... We're desiring something, if you're desiring something bad and you're saying it's God, you're confusing your feelings and the Holy Spirit. Don't do that. You're essentially trying to create God in your own image instead of shaping yourself into his image. I'm going to say that again because I think it's important. You're trying to create God in your own image instead of shaping yourself into his image. We are his image bearers. He's not our image bearer. We have to remember who we're supposed to be shaping. We're supposed to be shaping ourselves, not this metaphysical reality that God has already established as the law. So feelings do have their proper place, though. But you first have to be shaped in God's image, that he can shape you into his new creation. This is the point of surrendering and putting faith in Christ. You put your faith in Christ, and then sanctification begins, and we can be shaped into his image, and we can experience the peace that passes understanding. We can, uh, we can feel and see everything the way God sees it, at least as much as we can in this physical world. 2 Corinthians 15, 17 through 21 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Notice the focus here. The new creation, when we are saved, we become a new creation. That means we have to be reconciled to God, not our own feelings, not what's popular in the culture, not what's popular even in Christian culture or your church at home. It's about what God says. So reconcile yourself unto him. Whenever you have feelings, you must first check them with God. Do not read verses out of their context in an attempt to verify your own thoughts or feelings. People do this way too much nowadays. For example, an extreme one, but one that people do use, is people say that transgenderism is biblical or is not against God because Paul said there 
in, in Christ there is no male or female. And there, so since there's no male or female, gender is a social construct, and, there is, and transgenderism is okay. That's not what that verse is saying. If you read that verse in context, you know what, God, what he's saying is that in Christ we are all equal, but we are not distinct from our own roles, because that's why I say there's no male or female in Christ, no slave or free, nor Jew or Gentile. He's still acknowledging the distinct areas. You know, there's slaves and there are free. There are Jews and there are Gentiles. And there are male and female. But in Christ, we are all equal in value. Not saying that we're all, I don't know, what's the word I'm looking for? Fluid in our roles. That's not what that's meaning. Psalm 34, 4 says, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. And that's another thing. Nowadays, we have people with anxiety. We have people with depression. And, all, and, and we're just trying to medicate it all the time. And I'm not saying that medication's bad, okay? Medication can help people. I am a man who does like science, okay? I'm a man of science, even though some people would disagree, even though because I'm Christian, and therefore you can't mix science and religion. Okay, whatever. Totally disagree. Some of the greatest scientists have been Christians. Anyway, I won't get on that hobby horse. But I saw the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Another thing about our feelings is that sometimes they defeat us, and we have to go to the Lord, seek him, and he will deliver you, not your feelings, not always your therapist. I mean, you could go to those, and they can help you, right? A therapist can help you. Medication can help you, but the Lord is the anchor. If you don't have the Lord, you're going to have a really hard time working out all your issues. Uh, Vodi Bauckham says, said this, and I think it's a powerful quote, the Lord told me is not a substitute for the Bible says. The Lord told me is not a substitute for the Bible says. And I think that is something that we are deeply missing in our culture. The Bible was inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. And it says that the Spirit moved as they penned. And the Bible is inspired, which means God breathed. So therefore, we know these are God's holy inspired words. Well, if that's the case, then the Lord's not going to say something that's contradicting that. So stop confusing them. So guys, my point here is all of these things, like, and a lot of people do this, they, especially um, if they've been traumatized in church, they will come back to the Bible trying to seek new understanding. Like maybe the church must have been wrong on everything. They try to shape almost a new Christianity from it. I've seen this a lot, especially dealing with uh, the recovering fundamentalists and us being associated there and our, our friends and network that we have. With that, like a lot of people, because of so many things that they've gone through, they, are, they left church entirely, and then they start reading the scripture in their own way, and suddenly they leave orthodoxy entirely because they start reading it in their own view, and their own thoughts and feelings, instead of going by what historically has been taught by what that has always meant. So when you go by that, uh, when you start doing things and you start conflicting with scripture, and then you start reading scripture out of context and try to make it mean something that's never meant in the history of Christianity or Judaism, you're in really, really troubled waters there, my friend. You're in very troubled waters because there's a certain arrogance to that, that your thoughts and your feelings somehow you have found the new truth and that all the early church fathers, all the prophets and rabbis of old were all wrong. You're the new right. That's not how this works. There is orthodoxy. And even if somebody hurt you in the church, or maybe somebody took a doctrine too far, that doesn't mean that, that everything that person has said or everything that that church has taught is suddenly wrong too. Don't let your feelings control you. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. And once you, he leads you and you follow him into that glorious truth, you will find a new peace that passes understanding. You will find something greater than you've ever found before. You will find rest at his feet. And then you will find courage and boldness and a desire to teach and witness to others. That is what we're talking about here. We, are, it's, we have to remember that we are a deceived and broken people. And without the guidance of our Lord, Satan or our sinful nature will always lead us astray every single time. So depend on God. Seek his way. I know this sounds a little preachy right now, but it's the truth. Don't confuse your feelings with the Spirit. Also, don't confuse your feelings with reality. Feelings and facts are different things. 
feelings should be on the bottom tier of everything around you as far as how you interact with reality. And I know that's not a popular opinion, but first it needs to start with God. Then it needs to go into reality. What is real and objective reality? And then after that, all right, where do I direct my feelings? How should I feel about this? And even if you feel against that, you know what? Discipline your feelings because those are subjective and they're ever, ever changing and not always reliable. So anyway, uh, hope, and by the way, that's not also saying like, because a lot of people will use that, like people will use, you know, your heart is deceitful in a way to control you. Like, oh, well, anything you think or feel, you know, everything you think, you know, or feel is bad. Therefore, you're the heart is deceitful. Follow the man of God. I'm the man of God. Do what I say. Yeah, some people take that idea to an extreme to control people. That's why I'm not saying to go to people for your wisdom, for all the wisdom. I'm telling you to go to God. Follow what his word says, follow orthodoxy, follow proper doctrines to get there, and then discipl discipline your feelings from there. Don't let some random dude tell you that, well, just because you thought it, it must be wrong. Check it with scripture and also be willing to hear the advice of maybe somebody, though. Somebody might actually have a good point. That's why we are supposed to surround ourselves with a multitude of counselors. So it's not saying that hearing from people is bad. Hearing from people can be good, but you have to use proper discretion to make sure that these are people who love the Lord and make sure these are people who know how to handle God's word responsibly because there are progressive and conservative Christians who'd use it very disrespectfully and very loosely in order to fit their narrative. And that's because they allow their feelings to dictate their hermeneutic and then they're taking their twisted hermeneutic and presenting it to you. Don't do that, all right? Don't allow that to happen. Be careful on who you go to for advice. So anyway... Don't confuse your feelings with scripture. Cool? All right. I think I've said enough that enough, but it's just something that bothers me. I see it all the time on Facebook. I interact with it all the time in person with people, and it's something that I think is utterly destroying the church because there's a reason why the church is so divided, and half the time it's because people are confusing their feelings with the word. So anyway, thank you guys for tuning in to church to the church split. My name is Will. Don't forget to like and sub, and I will see you guys soon on our next episode. Take care.